Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. And welcome to our fabulous New Year's Eve special. Yay. It's New Year's Eve, Stephen. Now, we do post every week, so hit subscribe and the notification bell if you want to know exactly what we're doing every week. Stephen, 2021 <laughs> is coming to an end. Yes, <laughs> it is. What, were your, what is your high point for the year? I have to say the, the thing that really got me going as a gardener was yeah. when I was told by the people at the Weather Bureau yes. that in fact we are up for an, a La Nina event as opposed to an El Nino. Aha, a La Nina event. Now for those of you not on the east coast of Australia, we might explain what that means for gardeners later on in the show. So yes. do hang on to listen to weather patterns. My high point is that we're not in lockdown anymore. <laughs> yes. I have very simple needs. <laughs> yes. But Stephen, enough of that, yes. enough about me. What are we gonna look at today? All right, today we're going to look at a really, really worthwhile climbing plant for the garden. Okay. Unlike an unworthwhile climbing plant. <laughs> there are lots of those, I have right. to say. Yes, I but not in your garden. Uh, well, hopefully not. Uh, I've trialed a lot over the years and some have turned out to be a little less than perfect. Aha. Uh -huh. Because climbing plants are like puppies. They're not just for Christmas. You've got to know what you're doing with them. You've got to put them in the right aspect. You've got to tend them, care for them, train them and even be firm with them oh my on a regular goodness. basis. This is sounding like a very extraordinary show. I must just say that over your shoulder yes. is a lovely clematis. It is not that that we're no, talking about. No, it is not that that we're talking about, although I have to say that that particular style of clematis, the viticellas, oh, yeah. are my favourite group because they don't get clematis wilt and they're easy to manage and they flower for months. So okay. well worth growing, All but right. it's not about that. That's a segue. Uh, but perhaps behind you is something white that is clinging to the side of the house. And is that what we're looking at? Oh, yes, that is definitely what we're going to talk about. Okay. And believe it or not, for those who are still wondering, it's actually a hydrangea. Okay, let's stop there and go and have a look because a climbing hydrangea, I need to see this. Yes. Well, Matthew, here it is. This is my plant of Hydrangea simanii. Hydrangea simanii. Um, so many questions. <laughs> yes. Firstly, it, uh, well, the flowers look hydrangea-y, yep. but it, it looks nothing like a hydrangea. Talk me through the, the whole concept of a climbing hydrangea. Yeah. Well, it's one of those really weird things because people really don't expect there to be climbing plants in a woody genus like hydrangea. No. And in fact, the climbing hydrangeas as a group have become even larger recently mm. because the taxonomists have been at work mm. and there's a whole range of other genera that have been included into hydrangea and they're nearly all climbing plants. So right. those of you who are in the know will realise that Schizophragma, which had only one bract per flower, mm -hmm. is now considered to be a hydrangea. Decameria that had no bracted flowers is now a hydrangea. This is all double Dutch to yeah, me. Yeah, and it is. But anyhow, I, I feel the need to get it off my chest. Get it, get it yeah. off your horticultural and chest. And Pilostegia for those who are in the know. Okay. So there's a whole range of climbing hydrangeas that you can buy. They are both evergreen and deciduous species. Mm -hmm. And they come from a really wide ranging area. So this is my next question. I would have imagined that perhaps they're Chinese or or. or from East Asia. But yeah, wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Shoot that down. Yeah. There are some that yes. come from that part of the world, but this one, mm. Simanii, is actually Mexican. Goodness me. <laughs> yeah, so it comes from Mexico and it has a relative uh, that looks rather similar to it called Integrifolia that grows right down into South America. Mm. And I've seen it growing up the side of southern beech trees in Chile. Uh, right. And probably growing to the very top of the trees. And that's another thing with the climbing hydrangeas. They will fill the space allocated. Okay, goodness me. I think we have to stop and pause. So firstly, there's a huge range so I would then assume there's a huge climatic and condition range for them or are they fairly similar in their needs and fairly desires? similar I think yeah. one or two of the evergreen ones might not be quite as cold hardy mm. uh, as some of the deciduous ones would be mm. certainly some of the evergreens I've seen growing in uh, in Britain and other parts of the world uh, and doing fine in the Pacific Northwest in yeah. uh, the USA I've seen yeah. the, the climbing hydrangeas growing there yeah. the thing you've got to remember is that because they're hydrangeas they love the shade Yes. So that tends to put them into a more sheltered environment, even in a more severe climate. So naturally cooler, naturally damper, yeah. naturally yeah. 
chillier in winter. Yes, exactly. So most of them are probably growable if you've got, well, in the southern hemisphere, a southern wall, in the northern hemisphere, a northern wall. And this, this one is growing on a southern wall with quite a steep pitched roof, so yeah. very little direct sun. Yeah, it gets a little burnt on the very top when the sun's right overhead, when we get one of those really, really hot days. Yeah. But otherwise, it's fairly easy going. The evergreen ones with their leathery leaves tend not to be quite as water hungry. So question, is this an evergreen one? Yes. Right. Yes. Simanii is one of the best of the evergreen climbing hydrangeas. Okay. And the other thing it does that other hydrangeas don't do is it flowers from a bud. So when you were showing me that, that to me looks very much like a camellia bud. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, as most people who've grown hydrangeas over the years will know, hydrangea flowers tend to just erupt through the foliage as the stems get taller and taller. So it's an unusual occurrence to actually have one that has a flower bud. So yeah. that's one of its major differences. The Similarities though amongst the climbing hydrangeas are interesting. They're all self-clinging climbers, yes. so they produce aerial roots on the backs of the stems that will attach them to the wall or like structure. Like ivy or exactly. creeper, Boston and ivy. It has exactly the same thing as an ivy in that it also, not only does it cling by aerial roots, so it'll run up a brick wall, up a tree trunk, yep. uh, on a timber fence, it'll run up almost anything you can grip hold of, yep. uh, but it also has the habit of having adult growth as opposed to juvenile growth like ivy does. Ivy will have small leaves and run up a wall. Hang on, this I'm not understanding. Explain that to me. Well, <laughs> I understand the concept of juvenile and adult, but... Yeah, well, juvenile growth on these as well as ivies uh, has smaller leaves and it runs up the wall or the support it's got. Right. When it gets to the top of its support, it then produces shoots that come out of the support and that's where the flowers will sit. Uh, and uh -huh. the same happens with ivy as happens with these climbing hydrangeas. The only major difference is that the foliage doesn't change appreciably with the climbing hydrangeas, whereas with ivy it does. So one of the things that strikes me about this is these branches, which are the adult growth. Yes, are they exactly. Yes. But they're actually quite woody. It's, yes. it's you just wouldn't look at it and think it's a self-clinging climber. No, you wouldn't. Uh, although having said that, if you've got nowhere to climb it, it can actually be grown as a shrub. So it, it just sort of tumbles amongst No, itself. no, it doesn't. It'll just send up adult wood from the base because it's got nowhere else to go. Ah. Uh, it might have some juvenile that'll run along the ground trying to find somewhere to climb up. But in fact, it will just produce a bush. So you could use this as a as a specimen shrub in a, in a shade area. Yeah, yeah, in amongst other hydrangeas, in fact, it would be perfectly fine. And then you've got an evergreen in amongst your deciduous. How cunning. Yeah. Now, you, you briefly mentioned that the evergreens are not as water hungry as others. Yeah. So uh, this one is planted against the wall. Do you ever water it? Uh, very rarely, but it is a quite damp spot against the wall of the yeah. house. So uh, the vegetable garden, which is out to the left. Your uh, favorite part of the garden. Yeah, my favorite part of the garden. It gets watered. So of course, some of the moisture comes down into here. Yeah. And being a south facing wall, of course, it stays cool and, and damp anyway. Yeah. So I don't have to water it terribly often. And really the only management I have now that it's growing well is is to remove dead flower heads but not take off all of that adult foliage because if you're tidy and you prune it right back to the wall all the time mm. you won't get adult foliage that you therefore won't get flowers uh -huh. so, so it has to be able to stick out off the wall and it, it blooms from that growth so yes. if you're yes. over pruny you will have no flowers i regularly get clients who come in and said i planted one of those seven years ago it's never flowered what's going wrong and the first thing i ask is what's your Do pruning you prune regime? every year yeah uh -huh. and if the pruning regime is to keep it tidy against the wall you won't flower it and that also raises the issue of how you get it started. Yes. So that's another thing you need to know. Self-clinging climbers tend not to be able to be attached to the wall physically. You can't just put it there and, I don't know, put some blue tack on the wall or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. and hold it in place. It just doesn't work. So you buy a young plant, you plant it against the wall, you put the stems you know, along the base of the wall, and then I generally lay a brick or a rock or a piece of wood against it so that it can't move in the wind. And once it gets its act together and realizes it's got a frame behind it to grow up, mm. it'll start to attach. As soon as it does that, 
It's all over. It's easy. So it's somewhat of a slow starter. It can be. It can take that first season to get its act together and realise where it's going and how it's going to go. Yeah. But once it does, I mean, this plant is covering a wall that's probably probably eight metres long-ish. It's quite a long wall. Oh, if not more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's gone to the top of the, the wall, so it's growing out and around the spoutings a little bit. And this has taken around about eight to ten years. I was going to say how old it is. Mm. Now, the other thing that one hears about self-clinging plants particularly about ivy, yeah. is the damage to the brickwork. Ah, yes. Where do you stand on that fence? I stand on the, on the side of the plant. Uh, unless you've got a fairly old building with, yeah. say, a brick building with old mortar, mm. because before the 1920s, mortars used to be made as lime mortars. Mm. So very unless, crumbly. Very crumbly. And then it still won't do any damage to the wall unless you decide to peel it off, and then it'll pull chunks of mortar out. Mm. If your mortar is a cement mortar, it can't do any harm. Mm. And of course, when it's just sitting there on the wall, it's not actually delving into the wall. It's just attaching to the wall. It's just so, sticking. Yeah, so it's perfectly benign as far as I'm concerned. Right. And in fact, some self-clinging climbers can be very useful as um, passive solar things. I was going to say, so it becomes a microclimate and a microhabitat for insects, birds, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Exactly. Yeah. And are the flowers, where is one? Are the flowers fragrant? Uh, no, not really. I don't no. think there's any sort of particular scent to them. And I might add, as a group, climbing hydrangeas don't do colour as a rule. They're basically all white. white. There is one of the ones that used to be called a schizophragma that's now a hydrangea that unfortunately was called schizophragma hydrangeoides, so is now hydrangea hydrangeoides. It has a pink version. <laughs> These botanists, I don't know. And then the other million dollar question is propagation and finding it. Yeah. Well, that's another interesting thing about this group, not just necessarily because this one. The other hydrangeas, are, you could propagate mm. them in your sleep yeah. by, you know, stepping on one. I don't know. They're so easy to propagate yeah. from cuttings. These aren't. <laughs> I might add that they're easy enough to propagate, but not from cuttings. And the oh. way I propagate any of the climbing hydrangeas yeah. is by layers. Because their juvenile growth will grow across the ground, ah. I just go along the bottom of my plant every year and find... And, and find rooted layers that I can then chop off and pot up individually. Right. You can also do that by planting a young plant into a big polystyrene box or something like that and pinning it down and keeping it on the ground. And seed? Well, so I guess seed's possible with most of these but things. You've but you've never tried. I've never bothered. Mm. Hydrangeas have very fine seed. They're not always that easy to germinate from mm. seed. So I've never really bothered. Uh, and of course, you've got to go through a, a prolonged juvenile phase if you're going to, in fact, raise things from seed. And just grow up. Yes, that's right. So a layered piece is generally the best way to go. And you can do that with any of the climbing hydrangeas and their, their close relatives. Ah, there you are. So hydrangea seamanii from Mexico. Look out for the whole group. They are a fabulous group of climbers. And I can't think of any other self-clinging, shade-loving, flowering climber that you can grow in a wide range of habitats and climates like these. No. Oh, and I guess the last thing is the flowering season. So when is it in bloom? All right. Most of them flower in summer. Some will be out, uh, well, in the Southern Hemisphere, some will be out a little before Christmas. Mm. Uh, others might go into more January, early February. And most of them will flower for around about two months each. Oh, so that's quite long. Yeah, so it's not a bad flowering period. And if it's a cool season, even better. And it's also very handsome. And I, I do like the way that the branches sort of drape off with the flowers looking upright. It's a very lovely habit. Mm. And it's really beautiful on the side of your house. Yeah. And, and uh, the other thing with it, it won't keep going because there's nowhere else for it to go up above. Mm. I generally have to prune it back from windows and things a little bit just mm. to sort of be able to see out of them uh, and clean them around the spoutings and stuff. But unlike yeah. other climbers that will just keep going and end up running across the roof, once they get to the top of the spoutings, they tend to go adult and just sort of sit there. Mm. So they're very manageable climbers, in fact. Interesting. Well, I'm sold on climbing hydrangeas. Well, there we go. <laughs> Mr. Ryan, the climbing hydrangea. Well, they are just stunning. So happens that I have in our new house a shady courtyard Ooh. with a south-facing wall. Aha, I've got a sail. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, before we go any further, though, let's just roll back and talk about La Nina that you mentioned ah, yes. at the beginning as being your high point for the year. Yes. So for those of you perhaps not on the east coast of Australia, the Australian weather patterns are often influenced by the relative temperature of the Pacific yep. and its temperature rising, etc., can cause these cycles called El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, hot 
dry, dry awful. La Nina, <laughs> cold, well, cooler and wetter, and associated extreme weathers, either drought or flood or extreme heat and fire. Either way, they're often negative. Yes, but they can tell be. Me, so in terms of gardening here on the east coast of Australia, in, in Melbourne, um, what does La Nina mean to you, Stephen? It means my hydrangeas flourish. <laughs> Plants that like a little bit of moisture, uh, they're going to get regular rain. Uh, it will have its downsides. I mean, I won't grow my summer vegetables particularly well this year. Because so. you were joking about tomatoes. So tomatoes mm. in your climate, because you're a bit higher, yeah. just don't have enough time to... <laughs> I haven't even put tomatoes in this year because I've decided that it's probably pointless. We're going to get much too uh, cooler weather. Mm. Uh, and it will be the same for most of my summer crops. I'll grow plenty of leafy greens. Mm. Uh, I'll have lovely beans, I'm sure. But yes, I haven't even bothered with some of those things because of the sort of weather events we've got. But the plant we're talking about today is loving this cool weather. Loving and La Nina. It's, yeah, its flowers will last longer too. And it's too. Mexican, so it understands. <laughs> yes, that's right, exactly. It speaks Spanish as well. So it is going to be a great year for a lot of the sorts of plants I grow. But what was the other thing you were mentioning too, that there is also less fear, particularly living in the country, yep. about the weather conditions? Yeah, well, of course, we're, Victoria is a very, very fire-prone area, a bit like California and other parts of the world, mm. uh, some parts of Europe as well. And we have the added disadvantage advantage of having an awful lot of eucalyptus trees that grow around here mm. that go up like a, a candle when we do get fire. Mm. So for us in southern Australia to have a cool weather pattern for the summer is actually a huge relief. So I'm quite happy not to be able to grow too many tomatoes. There you go. That's the price you pay. No tomatoes for no worry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, that is our New Year special done and dusted. What could the New Year bring, Mr Ryan? I hope a whole pile of interesting plants and maybe some interesting people and certainly some very interesting gardens. Yes, I am looking forward to that, to our continuing adventures. Happy New Year, Mr Ryan. And same to you, Mr Lucas. Happy New Year to all of you thank you so much for following us for the last year and subscribing it's been a pleasure and here's to 2022 full of happy horticultural joy exactly we'll see you next week all right bye all